Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Jason. Just giving a last couple of seconds here for folks to jump into the broadcast and then we'll get started. All right, thanks to everybody for taking some very valuable time here. Again, my name is Jason, and today we'll be talking more in depth about oil markets for the beginning trader, some ways to learn about markets, some of the different dynamics and fundamentals that go into the oil markets, and certainly look at the trading opportunities provided by the Nadex platform for the oil trader. Let's jump right in. Again, my name is Jason, and uh, I'm really looking forward to our time together here. One thing I firmly believe is that study and preparation are certainly critical to the su success of any trader. Now, knowing that, I find that folks are most eager to study the markets that interest them most. That certainly makes sense. My sole intent today is to demonstrate ways which traders can learn about those markets, specifically during our time here today, the oil market, so that you can then go and based on your risk tolerance and your goals, build a trading strategy to take advantage of those opportunities. I personally find oil markets fascinating. I'm constantly looking for ideas and strategies around how to trade them on Nadex, and I encourage you to do the, the same as it fits into your trading plan. Now, if you are interested specifically in oil and energy markets and want to know how they work so that you're able to effectively trade them, then our short time together today certainly will be well spent. First, let's take a look at our risk disclaimer. I'll give everybody 10 to 20 seconds to read through this before we really get going. All right, now our learning objective today is to understand how the oil market works at a foundational level and where to go to access the information and data that makes the markets move. Now towards the end of the presentation today, I wanna to look at some real market scenarios and trades to give you a sense of the different strategies available for trading oil on Nadex. As we div discuss the different topics today though on our way to those specific examples, I encourage each of you to stay focused on what we study and how the different things that we study can make markets move. Traders typically need that movement and an understanding of volatility in order to profit from a trade. Now, the good news about oil markets is that they're well studied and well reported on and certainly highly vulnerable to geopolitical events and other sources of volatility, which again is one reason why I love trading oil markets so much. There's also a lot of information and data available so that you can study those markets. Now, as an oil trader, when you are looking to form an opinion on your market of choice, in this case oil, there are so many directions you can turn and angles that you can pursue for that data and information. It can make for very robust trading ideas and trading plans. Now on the flip side, I know with firsthand experience, you can certainly get lost in too much data. Our focus today will certainly hopefully help you with that. You can build a very sound and informed opinion on oil markets with relatively few high quality sources of data. Now the best part is that data is released at regular intervals that you as a trader can plan on. My goal today is to help you potentially know when the market may move so that you can be there with a basic trade plan to participate and hopefully profit. As I said, my name is Jason. It's certainly an honor to be with you. Please never hesitate to reach out if I could be of assistance to you on social media. If you have a question or just a trading idea you want to bounce off somebody, I'm always available. My basic approach in a nutshell is to study quantitative data, model it mathematically, and understand it the best that I can for myself, while I also pay keen attention to the broad market fundamentals, the macro forces, those higher level things that also act on markets to move them in future directions. So let's look at our learning plan here. Let's look at it more in depth, exactly what we'll learn today. This is fairly simple and linear. We're gonna cover the basics of the market at a high level so that we can then talk about how to form an outlook or an opinion on oil markets. That's gonna be key for us as a foundation, as a trader. Then we'll really dive into the heart of our time together, and that is an understanding of the calendar and some of the data that we have access to as a trader. From there, we're gonna discuss how to use short-term options to trade based on the outlook that we formed and the data that we now have. And we will look at, as I said, 
towards the end of the presentation some specific real world examples of oil trades using the concepts that we learned earlier in the presentation. Finally, at the end, we'll have a discussion on volatility, certainly one of my favorite topics, and some special strategies and types of trades that we can execute to use market price swings to our advantage as a trader. Now, one of the most beautiful aspects, in my opinion, of the oil market is that it cleanly represents several basic pillars of fundamental economics. In a very fundamental way, the forces of supply and demand converge in a global marketplace that is then studied and wide, widely reported on. The demand tends to be fairly stable and predictable. If we think about those two principal forces of economic supply and demand, on the demand side of the equation in oil markets, it's a fairly steady phenomenon. The demand for oil historically normally is going to track economic growth and the rate at which economic economies throughout the world in turn develop. Now, in the United States, as the economy grows faster, typically, and I'm certainly uh, one who does this, uh, if you've got more money to spend, maybe you're taking you know, more vacations, you're driving more places, you have more disposable income and you're using more energy. Internationally, as a country like China or India, for example, develops, they will use more oil as their need for energy increases. Their industry might be powered by it, you know, more cars might be sold, and generally, a more developed country is going to need more fuel and power. Again, this is a fairly stable dynamic that can be closely watched and anticipated. Now, a great deal of volatility in the oil market is going to originate from the supply side of the equation. Producers can limit or expand their drilling based solely on the price that they can get for their product in the market. If price is going up, exploration and drilling companies can add more rigs, which ultimately adds more supply, which can then bring down price. The opposite, obviously, is true as well. When oil price is low, drill drillers might limit the number of rigs because profit margins are fleeting. That will constrain supply, which, of course, then raises price. Now, what's going to add volatility is the fact that, at least on the supply side, the markets can receive and then react to data that is merely a signal and still open to interpretation by large investment houses or individual traders. For instance, let's say producers add more rigs in a week. That does not necessarily mean that there's going to be more supply of oil next week. It's going to take, at the very least, several weeks for additional rigs to add incrementally more oil. And in the span of that several weeks, in a future week, they may reduce the number of rigs. So it's really hard to tell based on that individual phenomenon in that week. Or let's say we do see a few more million barrels being placed into inventory, indicating more supply than needed. Now, you might see an outsized impact based on the trends that markets see the balance of supply and demand moving in eventually roll through the markets. For example, uh, let's say we add 4 million barrels of oil into storage. That might only be a 1% increase of the total oil in storage. However, you might have a market move of, let's say, down 2% on that news, given that markets are going to anticipate more supply-related issues downstream based on the trend or overall direction that they see markets heading in. Now, another aspect of oil markets that can certainly make them enjoyable to track is that they're very global or international in nature. Oil is produced all over the world. This also means, of course, that supply disruptions can happen from anywhere and increase in demand can come from anywhere as well. So in addition to data, one thing we'll talk about is news flow should always be monitored while you're participating in the oil markets. Geopolitical events and uh, in oil producing hotspots, as we all know from our own experience, can definitely impact oil prices. And one of the reasons oil has been lower uh, over the last year, let's say, than it was 10 years ago is that in some of those geopolitical hotspots, while they might still have issues or challenges, the level of drama and supply-related disruptions, and even in some cases violence, is much less because as those events happened, Certainly, they rose the price of oil above and beyond the simple market fundamentals of dynamics. So for our purposes, 
we're going to look closer to home and we're going to look at a grade of oil known as West Texas International Crude Oil. And this is what we'll look at exclusively for the purposes of our trading here on Nadex. WTI is a specific grade of crude. It's used as a benchmark in pricing domestically. And as I said, it's the underlying commodity that is used for trading oil on Nadex. Now, as you study oil, you might have seen Brent Sea Crude, uh, all, North Sea Crude also referenced. Brent Crude is a global benchmark. It's the underlying commodity for contracts in, say, Europe and in other places around the world. It normally trades a few dollars higher than WTI for some very specific reasons that we won't get into today. But just know that everything we talk about today is focused solely on WTI crude, as again, that's the underlying that will trade here on Nadex. Now, to form an oil uh, opinion, a, a, an opinion of the oil market, we're going to want to look into the oil market as it represents the value of WTI crude. And we're going to use both raw data that we can all review as traders and that we can pursue. And we can also look at and take in analysis from other sources, as well as the news flow I mentioned earlier. And the analysis that you put together certainly should help you form your own opinion. Ultimately, you're gonna to wanna to base your trades on what you think will happen, which hopefully has been formed as a result of your own learning, preparation, and study. Now, it's also helpful for you to know, though, the broader market sentiment behind oil and where others see it headed. Remember, always when you're trading oil, you're trading in a very large universe of other traders. They're all interpreting data just like you are, and collectively, all traders will form a market. So it's not just the news that we're gonna talk about or the data that we're gonna talk about and your opinion of it that matters. We should always be mindful how we think others will interpret that data and how that might move markets. Just because a large investment house or bank, in addition, you know, might have their own opinion or forecast for oil, it also does not mean that their analysis will necessarily come to fruition. However, what is important and what an insightful trader realizes is certainly it follows that that could be an indication of how they're trading and the market moving impacts potentially that they may see on the horizon. So while far from a complete list, these are some of the producers of market moving information and data, and we're going to look at several examples here in the slides that follow. This is a good cross section here of sources. We have cartels representing many countries like OPEC, private companies like Baker Hughes. On the other hand, the United States Energy Information Administration is an American governmental institution, and the International Energy Agency represents 29 different member nations. One thing to keep in mind is you're always going to want to know and stay mindful of the inherent biases, the historical importance of the data you're looking at, the agendas and viewpoints of each source of data, because that can certainly help you decipher their forecasts. They're certainly not always in agreement, and often you'll be interpreting conflicting viewpoints. OPEC, for instance, as we know, uh, has a keen interest in higher prices over the long term, while the IEA or EIA simply shares the data that they collect. However, they may still over or underestimate trends and be wildly off in their forecast. Baker Hughes, on the other hand, is a private company, uh, part of GE, and they have a very narrow scope around oil field equipment, and they can only report on what they collect as a private corporate entity. So it's not only acceptable, but really something I encourage for you to factor in your own opinion, the bias both stated and unstated, that you perceive in these other market participants. You wanna take data from several sources and piece it together to form your own view of the market. You'll then be able to take your market view and apply it to your search for trading opportunities. And we will look at a few examples, as I said, of these opportunities and way to build a strategy later in the presentation. All right, this is a look at the calendar of what I certainly consider to be very important weekly releases of information. These all have the opportunity and the potential to offer trading opportunities. They can certainly all create volatility and have the ability to move markets. Now, as we look at each of these sources in greater detail, you can, should consider that the data that they're gonna report is often 
what I would call a race against expectations. In addition to the raw data, what's going to be as important or even more important is to view that data in relation to what the market expects. Let's say the American Petroleum Institute and the Energy Information Agency, two sources that provide data on inventory levels, and we'll look at some of that detail here in a second. Let's say they report there's a build in inventories. Now this is news, a build in inventories can normally be thought of as, generally speaking, bearish for price. But that might not move markets if, or it might not move markets much if the market was expecting and had already priced in an inventory build based on, let's say, elevated drilling levels that they'd seen in the weeks previous. Now, on the other hand, let's say API reports a drawdown of inventories, but the EIA, the following day reports a build, that certainly could have an outside, outside impact on markets as traders might have expected a drawdown from my EIA based on the fact that API reported that a day before. Or maybe let's say we're in a declining price environment, for example, traders are expecting producers to ramp up production. If Baker Hughes is going to report a decrease in rig count, that could surprise markets and be more constructive for current price levels. So let's discuss oil inventory levels this is much or more than anything on a weekly basis is going to be the critical data, specifically speaking to oil inventory levels that moves markets. Again, there are things on any given week that can move markets more than the inventory reports. But for most weeks, the oil inventory reports from API and then most importantly from EIA are going to be your most market moving sources of data. Oil is reported in barrels, in case you're not aware. That's simply just a way to traditionally measure the volume of oil. So right now, speaking today, we have around 430 million barrels of oil in storage. This is right around the middle of the average range, generally speaking, over the past five years for this time of year. Now, for some years, we've had as much as 550 million barrels, and some years it's been down around 350 million barrels. So on a week-to-week -week basis, to provide you some context as we look at this data, it's not uncommon for the amount of oil in storage to go up or down by a few million barrels. Anything, generally speaking, plus or minus 5 million barrels is fairly typical. More than 5 million barrels, I personally would consider significant, whether it's a build or a drawdown. Now, on a week-to-week -week basis, as I said, oil inventory is the market's barometer for where they think the price of oil might be headed. If we're building excess supply of oil, of course, that would be thought of, as we said, more generally speaking, bearish. More supply means lower price. So let's look, as I said, more closely at these reports. This is the API report that we have up here on our screen. Um, it's a release on Tuesday afternoons. As we shared, it's data from the American Petroleum Institute. This is an industry trade group. It's a membership-based group. Not every oil participant in the country belongs to it. Sometimes they get criticism because some folks may feel their data is only limited to their members. Um, but it is a private membership-based trade group. So they primarily report on, in on inventory levels and in what you might hear referred to as their weekly statistical bulletin. Now, to be clear, you need a Thomson Reuters account to gain access to the raw report, but the reports are made available to the markets right away. And I just encourage you to follow your favorite financial news outlet for the data. You know, here I've got a screenshot from investing.com, whatever source of financial data you're normally using on Tuesday afternoons when that information hits the markets, it should be readily available to you as well. Now, the API, as we said, this report, it's not as market moving necessarily as the EIA report, which we will look at soon, and which on a typical week is reported on a Wednesday, the day after. But it is important as a weekly basis, as a barometer for trends in supply. And it also helps form market expectations, especially heading into that EIA report. The number that you'll be looking at from uh, API on Tuesday afternoons is the weekly change in inventory levels. Again, this is typically a plus or minus of a few million barrels. Now, on the other hand, the EIA report, Energy Information Administration report, is certainly the most robust weekly report 
and provides a wealth of information for each of us on a variety of angles, including not only production, but also refining, consumption, things like export levels, import levels, and regional details. Now, over time, this is probably the most, as we've said several times now, market moving regular data set that hits oil markets. You can access it right at 10.30 a.m. when it hits the EIA website. You're gonna have the same access as anyone else to all of the data. It moves markets, I would say, it's not uncommon for oil to move 50 cents to a dollar or more in the moments following the release of this report. Each week is a little bit different, but it's certainly more weeks than not moves in that 50 cent to a dollar range, and often you can have a, a larger move. Now, as a word of caution, and we'll look at some examples here in a second, normally the moves immediately following the release in the first minute or two can simply be large market limit orders being filled, and that does not necessarily indicate the eventual direction the price might take following the announcement through the rest of the trading session. If you're new to oil markets and you're going to start trading these reports, I really ask that each of you keep that top of mind. That first minute or two could just be a result of uh, large institutional limit orders being filled, and I would hate to see, you know, um, there'd be additional confusion if the market moves one way, you expect it at another, and then, you know, certainly um, that could be a frustrating experience if you're not keeping in mind that in some cases that initial move uh, could be simply large orders being filled. So certainly one thing there to keep in mind. Um, in addition to trading off the report for that session, I certainly encourage each of you, uh, certainly as you're getting started in oil market trading, you're able to take the report, download it, study it in greater detail to better inform your overall point of view on markets. Definitely other numbers in the EIA report matter as opposed to just the inventory levels. The inventory level is always the headline, but there's certainly some other numbers that matter. Things like levels of gasoline inventory, export import levels, levels of production are all important. It's also important as you gain expertise in deciphering oil market data to see how these numbers begin to work together, especially off the EIA report. Oil production, which is currently roughly about 10.5 million barrels a day in the US, maybe a little bit less than that. That's an important barometer for future supply trends. It's normally a fairly linear, stable trend. If export levels, let's say, go up at the same time and gasoline in inventories are reduced, that report in total could be very bullish for the market. Now, on the other hand, let's say inventory of oil goes down, gasoline inventory might be going up. That could mean that because gasoline inventory is going up, you know, we might need to refine less oil in future weeks. That could mean a bearish jump in inventory in a week or two in the near future. But there's no doubt, as I said, the most watched number in the EIA and API reports is the net change in crude oil inventories, often the immediate headline, and is you know, whether it's a drawdown or what's added to storage could certainly determine the market move through the rest of the trading session. So looking more closely at a bit of a technical level here, the EIA and API data, folks often as they're getting started in oil markets wonder, is there a correlation? As we looked at on the calendar, these uh, data releases are a day apart. Um, API is Tuesday afternoon, EIA is Wednesday morning at 10:30, and can you use one to, you know, help determine or predict, let's say, what the other is going to do? And the truth is, it's complicated. Uh, there's definitely a relationship mathematically between the two releases. If you look at the linear model in the upper left, that just shows a clear linear relationship on some level between EIA and API data. If, if uh, to get really technical about it, the, the level of relationship is about 73%. So it's enough to say this is a solid relationship or correlation here, but it's not enough to say one is necessarily predictive of the other, especially in a short-term trading situation. Um, we even see in some weeks, one may report a build and the other a drawdown. As you can see in the lower right, Certainly over time and over the course of weeks, you can see 
a relationship as they move in tandem directionally. And in some weeks, it matches pretty closely. However, on a week-to-week basis, it's very challenging. And in my personal opinion, as someone who spent some time on this, nearly impossible to gauge the number of one based on the number of the other. And it's not something I'd recommend. However, what I do recommend and what is important is to understand how these numbers set expectations and then see how the markets are going to move based on that. So, for example, let's say the API reports a draw of around 3 million barrels and the market moves just slightly higher. And then the EIA reports a draw of 3.5 million barrels as well. I might think as a trader that this EIA report is largely already priced in based on the API number. And I may expect, depending on a variety of other circumstances, I may expect less of a move in that situation than in a typical week coming off the EIA report because the expectation might already be priced in based on the API data. On the other hand, if the API reports a build of 5 million, and then EIA comes out with a report on 1030 at Wednesday with a draw of 1 million, I know as soon as I see that EIA number, it might be a volatile wild ride for the next hour or so, as markets correct, based on that move, given the two numbers were so divergent. The Baker Hughes report, uh, moving forward on our sources of data, it's released early Friday afternoon in the US trading session. And if there is thinner volume on a Friday, and some of us, as we know, based on our time in the markets, some funny things can happen from time to time on a Friday. Uh, it can move markets a, a little more depending on depending on what the volume and other situations look like. It could certainly add volatility, but it doesn't always add volatility, speaking to Baker Hughes. So this measures levels of, uh, measures the rig count or the number of rigs in a production environment, um, and it measures it more than the United States, but certainly lately and most generally, the most closely watched number is the number of rigs active in production in the United States. Increases in rig counts, you can see a copy of the report here, are seen generally, I'd say, as a signal of a coming increase in supply. Um, as we said, though, Friday afternoons can certainly be unpredictable, and it really depends on the magnitude of the increase or decrease. It certainly depends on uh, market expectations heading into the report. But this is a helpful report to follow the trend week to week and see how it informs the overall market narrative and just know that there could be an opportunity for volatility based on this trade. And you can always plan around that. So most of the time on Baker Hughes, we see a move of plus or minus a few rigs. Um, but at a basic level, um, and this is why one of the reasons why I do enjoy and appreciate trading on Nadex, for example, just to get a little more macro and broad about it, producers often decrease rigs in a declining price environment. So the number of rigs going down could certainly be seen in isolation as a bullish potential for a bullish type of move after the release. But if we're already in a much broader, stronger declining price environment, and that's why the number of rigs got reduced, that could be a conflicting signal to you as a trader. So that's why I really recommend on a week to week basis and why I love being able to trade the shorter term opportunities on Nadex, Generally speaking, understand the rest of the environment, look at the Baker Hughes rig count report, and if the number deviates from what you feel are market expectations and it's plus 10 or minus 15, you know you could sincerely get some serious volatility on that, especially on a low volume time, let's say like a Friday in, in the summer when there might be less activity. So oil markets, as we know, and we've spoken to a little bit, can certainly be notoriously unpredictable. And again, for some of us, that's pretty fun. Uh, it's certainly attributable to a variety of factors. Number one, they're global in nature, and they just have a lot of different moving parts. So there are a lot of other forces and factors that each of you as an oil trader can watch, study, use to gain insight, and can certainly sharpen your own expertise in any of these areas to help you understand 
um, based on your own market opinion, where the price of oil might be headed. So we have things like OPEC, again, a familiar term to most of us. They're always capable of making an announcement, floating a rumor, or litigating a flare-up in local Middle East politics. They have several meetings throughout the year. Some produce news, some don't. I would set a news, and I do, and I would encourage everybody on the call, you know, set a Google News Alert for OPEC. Maybe pick a couple of other terms you think uh, might be important, which will allow you to monitor the stream of news flow surrounding OPEC and staying abreast of their intentions. I highly recommend something as simple as a Google News Alert for that so you're never caught off guard. You can't count on every source of financial news that you rely on to share every potential development with OPEC given their global scope and ability to impact markets. EIA and IEA specifically also produce other data releases. We just looked at the EIA weekly data, but they're gonna produce monthly reports, annual reports. The EIA produces something called the, you know, the short-term monthly outlook for petroleum markets, a very important report. So I encourage each of you to check their calendar of releases on, again, their monthly, semi-annual, annual, quarterly type data releases. Put those dates in your calendar. Again, use those terms as well for a, a Google News Alert, let's say, and really stay informed of everything that's coming out uh, about the market. Other events, you know, fear of an outbreak of conflict in a world hotspot can certainly move oil markets just like it might move equity markets. Uh, typically, global tensions can put markets in what is known as a risk-off mood. So if the issues are specific to oil producing regions, price can certainly potentially move sharply higher based on the risk of a supply disruption. But if it's a you know, general risk-off sentiment, right, that could impact oil markets just like it impacts equity markets, depending on the market's interpretation. Other financial instruments like the U.S. dollar certainly impact oil. Because oil markets are denominated in dollars, a weaker dollar can allow other importers, specifically those in um, you know, underdeveloped or uh, newly developed economies, to buy more oil when the price of uh, oil is, for them, cheaper because the dollar is weaker. Now, when you look at something like, you know, the historical correlation between the price of oil and a weak dollar, it's certainly helpful to remember that whether or not that actually happens in any given moment in time, it's equally as important expectation for it to happen, especially for short-term options traders. So we could have a scenario where, let's say there's a sharp dip in the dollar, other oil traders pile into long positions on the expectation of more oil buying, just their level of expectation is what moves markets. Generally speaking though, certainly over longer periods of time, a weak dollar can be thought of as constructive to the price of oil. All right, now that we have looked at some of the sources of our data and we've looked at kind of the cadence or calendar of events, let's look at more closely some ways to trade oil markets here on Nadex. Nadex is, I hope and trust you know, certainly offers a variety of different options to allow a trader exposure to oil markets. Binary option asks a simple yes or no question. Will this market be above this price at this time? If you believe the answer is yes, you buy. If it's no, you sell. A Nadex spread lets you trade movements between the two price levels in either direction. Both of these types of options allow you to cap your risk ahead of time so that you know exactly what you have on the table as you enter a position. You can select from a variety of different time horizons. Certainly encourage that these should match your trading plan, your goals, and your risk tolerance. Um, and that you base trades based on your opinion of what's gonna happen in the markets and when. All right, let's look at some specific market action and how we can trade oil markets based on some of the concepts that we talked about. So this is uh, from February 7th, 2018. Uh, just some context for you. 
Um, the day before, the EIA had released the short-term energy outlook, one of those monthly reports I mentioned earlier. It indicated a strong lift in U.S. production, and the API had reported a 1.05 million barrel decline in crude inventories. So these two data points could be thought of as adding competing signals to the mix, right? They didn't necessarily agree. So the market had swung up and down heading into the EIA report based on the short-term outlook report that had been released the day before and the API report that had been released the day before. So we you know, saw this battle right between bullish news and which reported on declining inventories and a bearish forecast for accelerating production. So ultimately, the EIA reported a build, and as you can see, the report of that build certainly uh, caused some market movement and sent prices down very sharply. So let's look more closely at this action. You can see some sideways tight chop heading into the report. This indicates some level of disagreement in the market, but as you can see, the overarching trend is down until there was a spike in price right before the report. So the report comes out, and in a relatively short amount of time, we now have a sharp down move of over a dollar. This level of volatility is very important to understand, and it's why these reports can be so critical. You as a trader could have potentially a variety of strikes, both above and below the market price, which could ultimately profit as the market moves. Now in a few hours downstream, there on our chart to the right, you can see the market was down more than $2, but as we said, even within that first hour, we, just, we saw a decline of more than a dollar just based on the release of the EIA inventory report. So we'll look at an example of how to trade this action here in a few slides. This is an example. If we look at an opportunity around trading Baker Hughes, as we learn this comes Friday, this is February 2nd. Uh, this is around the release of, as I said, the Baker Hughes report. So the market had been moving up. It had been on a bullish run for a bit. Baker reported a net gain of six oil rigs. Now often, as we said several times now, uh, these moves are not as sharp as the EIA coming off the Baker Hughes report. Typically, they'll reinforce the prevailing market narrative. In this case, while it was not a huge rise, we did see an increase in rigs, and ultimately the market did move down with the, reporting at, with the report from Baker Hughes adding some additional volatility as the week closed. So as we can see more closely here, again, distinct sideways chop there on the left side of your screen heading into the report. Market ultimately took off in both directions following the report. Now, if you're a trader and you're trying to determine ahead of time the exact market move in this specific case, it would have been really difficult. You can see a rise of roughly a dollar followed by a decline back to roughly the same range we started there on the right side of the chart. So while it's tough ahead of time to specifically predict exactly the market direction, as you can see it moved both ways ultimately, this type of move does provide a trader exposure to several strikes due to the inherent volatility when the market receives this new data. So as we've seen, based on these uh, few examples, really the key common denominator here is volatility. From the fact, you know, that oil can be influenced by unpredictable events across the world to specific predictable data releases in the U.S., one characteristic, again, that I love and I get excited about with oil markets is that it does produce movement. And that movement can be what allows us as traders to potentially profit from that exposure to the market. So our ability to plan, build, and execute in that environment can set us apart, provided we take the time to study and understand the role that volatility plays. Now, in my opinion, a benefit to short-term binary options, like we have the opportunity to trade at Nadex, is we don't have to be right necessarily about the long-term trends. We don't have to carry you know, the additional potential risk that could come from carrying a position across many weeks and months. What I like to do is target specific time frames that we feel offer the potential for increased volatility, and we can trade based on that in a way that lets us cap our total risk ahead of time on Nadex. So let's take a look at a specific trade 
um, that the strategy is really built around an, an anticipation of volatility um, here in the oil market. So let's go back in our oil market time machine to January 11th, 2017. This is real market data. I'll just set the stage here for you. The market was hovering around $50. In my opinion, it's a key psychological level. This is a Wednesday morning, which we all now know, I hope, is the release of the weekly EIA uh, inventory report. So in late 2016, OPEC had announced a plan to limit production. It's now the start of 2017. As you recall, a new president was taking office in the US. January 11th, there's certainly more uncertainty uh, than is typical. We're coming out of the holidays, and with all of these factors swirling around the market, this was, I would say, in my opinion, a more anticipated report than normal. So markets, again, you look to the left side of the chart, were ranging sideways in advance of the report, which as we've seen now several times, uh, can be fairly typical. Now, as the report hit, there was a brief dip, you can see towards the middle of the screen. And again, this can simply be a result of a large number of, of limit orders being filled. So this type of scenario that we see setting up here and developing can potentially be a good candidate for a volatility-based trade. You have a highly anticipated data release. You've got a lot of factors swirling that folks are trying to subjectively interpret. You've got some sideways action heading into the data release. Uh, this is definitely a good potential setup for a volatility-based trade. So one type of volatility-based trade I'll walk you through in this example is known as a strangle. So let's walk through it. So if you look at the chart, if you are able to buy a strike above the current market level, and if we look right at 1030, the market was at 51.45. So if you're able to buy a strike above the current level and sell simultaneously a position below the current market level, you would in essence, as a trader, be stating your belief that you think the price is going to move, you are just unsure on direction, okay? So again, the market's at 51.45, you're looking for a strike above to buy, you're looking for a strike below to sell. In essence, you're taking two positions, both technically out of the money at the time that you take them on. You have a position you bought above the market and a position you sold below the market. This statement by you as a trader says that you think at least one of these positions will be in the money within the time frame you specify. Because the impending volatility that you foresee based on the conditions and setups around the market, you think that volatility will move the market enough in at least one direction to reach one of your strikes. So if the market moves up, certainly the, the contract you bought could profit if it reaches your strike and it'll certainly gain in value as the market moves closer to your position. If it goes down, you could profit if it ventures below your sell order strike. Now one thing to keep in mind as you look at this chart and think about potential setups, the market will always move towards either position at any given moment in time. Markets are always in flux. We're just looking at one moment in time here. So what you can do is set limit orders that allow you to profit if the new price of the contract is with you. And you can set up stops which allow you to exit if it moves against your position. So in this scenario, hypothetically, let's say you purchase each contract one above around 52, one below around 51. Let's say you're able to purchase each contract for $10, or you purchase one for 10 at 52 and sell one at 10, or sell at 90 at 51. You need a net profit from at least one of your positions beyond $20 plus fees to make a profit. So there are instances also, as you think about this and think about a real world this is a real world scenario, but think about your own trading. There's certainly instances where the market might move in both directions within your defined amount of time, which would allow for both positions to be profitable. Think back to the Baker Hughes example, where we saw you know, a sizable move up, and within the same hour, a move back down to a right around where we started. 
there are instances where the market does that and moves in both directions. It's just a volatile move, which can bring several different strike levels in play. Or maybe the market, as it did in this case, only moves in one distinct direction. And you can see it moves up and to the right. As long as it moves enough to gain a profit that clears your defined level of risk on both trades, you're able to pay for both trades with your profitable trade. So if the price remains in its range, that would be above your sell order but below your buy order, then unfortunately you would lose your predefined level of risk, which again is $20 plus fees. So what you are planning on in this case is that it moves out of that range one way or the other, or again, in some cases it may move in both directions. If it stays within that range below your buy order and above your sell order, that would be a situation where you would lose your $20 plus fees. Of course, just to be fully transparent about all your options here, uh, you can hold one or both contracts to expiration, knowing that the most you potentially lose is the $20 plus fees. Certainly if one contract expires in the money and one contract expires out of the money, the most you lose in that case would be $10 on the losing position while gaining potentially a full redemption on the winning position if it's above your strike when the uh, contract expires. So again, this is a strangle trade. One of my um, favorite opportunities when I see the setup arrive in the oil markets, I personally am constantly looking to learn more about volatility, the role volatility plays, and ways to take advantage of volatility I anticipate in the Nadex um, trading environment so that I can use those strategies and, and hopefully, in my case, certainly, um, end up with some profitable trades as well. So with that, that is the material I prepared for us. I am grateful for the time each of you spent, and hopefully this was beneficial to you. It certainly was to me as an exchange of ideas. Again, I encourage anyone on the call at any time to reach out on social media. I'd love to connect and hear more about your goals, what you're trying to do, and share with you any insight I have. With that, I just wish each of you luck, and thank you for your time, and happy trading.